Hi right, class, we are on to the next section, chapter 7.5, the Dirac Delta function. So the Dirac Delta function is a very, very important function. It comes up in a lot of applications. Um, if you're an engineer or a physicist, you are definitely going to study this, especially my engineers. You guys will be doing Laplace transforms and Dirac Delta functions all over the place. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to start off with a unit impulse function okay so a unit impulse function is very similar to the heavy side equation what's going to happen is you're going to be on for a short period instead of being off and then on and then having to be turned off okay so you're basically always off except for a short period of time okay and this period of time um, will always give you an integral value of one okay so if you integrate your function for the time that you are on right only the time that you are on you should always get out one okay All right so <clears throat> I'm off until I turn on I'm on for a short period the area under this curve is always going to be one and then I am off okay so that's why it's called a unit impulse function because you are on and you give a hundred percent of your impulse as a unit right a unit measurement until you're off again right um, in statistics there is a statistical function function um, that's very similar to this as well um, it's the the uniform distribution function in uh, statistics right this is obviously a little different um, so this monitors things where so the examples in your book are very very interesting so for instance maybe you have a surge of electricity right um, maybe you're talking about a sudden impact of something where there's nothing going on and then boom there's a sudden quick impact and then there's no more impact again right so the examples in the book are for instance hitting a golf ball right um, uh, uh, getting struck by lightning if you're in an airplane or things of that nature right so there's a sudden quick impulse and before that and after that there it's nothing going on right so <clears throat> The unit impulse function again has this property that if you integrate it um, you're only going to get one because the area under this curve is one right this has a height of one half a a length of two a this rectangle here is one half a times two a right so one half times two cancels you're gonna get one basically right so <clears throat> the limit of this function sorry and this isn't one half a this is one over two a Okay, apologies. 1 over 2a is, I didn't make this graphic, right? This is from the textbook. So 1 over 2a times 2a, right? So 2a over 2a is going to be 1, right? If you take this area. The limit of this function as a goes to 0 is what we call the Dirac delta function. So this is the unit impulse function, right? It begins at a, right? And it only lasts for a short period of time, okay? Um... We could say it lasts for a period of a and it starts at t naught. Okay, so let's think of this that this way. It starts at t naught and it has a length of uh, time of a. Okay, um, if it has a height of one over two a, right? So we'll talk about calculating this length here. Right, it really depends on the value that I have going on in this way. So as a gets smaller, right? What's going to happen here is that this length is going to get smaller as well, right? And that means that the height is going to have to get larger because the area has to always stay 1. So as A gets small, right, this is going to grow large. 1 over 2 times a smaller value gives you larger values. And this is also going to shrink, okay? So we call the Dirac Delta function the limit of the unit impulse function as A gets smaller and smaller, right? So here we have um, a value of a, okay, starting here, going for uh, two values of a, or it doesn't even have to be two values of a, it's whatever our value is, right? So it has some length here. When a gets smaller, the value is larger, right? It's more of a sudden impact, but its length is short. You can think of this as, I don't know, earthquakes, for instance, right? Maybe you have a low earthquake that's quick, but it's a little bit longer. 
than one very, very quick, hard jolt, right? If it has the same amount of intensity, whether that's dissipated over a longer time period or it's given all at once in a small, quick jolt, right? So that's what's going on, is that A is getting smaller, and so the length of this impulse is getting shorter, but the intensity is stronger, but it still has the same amount of energy inside of this impulse, right? Either it's dissipated over um, a, a longer period and a little less intense, or that same amount of energy is very, very intense over an extremely short amount of time. So what happens is the limit of these things at T naught goes towards zero, right? And if I'm not at my value of interest, I have nothing, right? Okay, I'm zero. And the integral over this direct delta function is going to equal one, or you can think of that as 100% of the impulse, right? So let's talk about the transform of the Dirac delta function. Um, the Dirac delta function is actually pretty easy to work with. It's pretty nice, actually. So as long as t is positive, the Laplace transform of the Dirac delta function centered at my point t naught is just e to the negative s times t naught. Right? When t naught equals 0, then the Laplace transform equals 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example. Um, say we need to administer a drug to a patient. Okay, so there's a few ways that doctors can administer a drug that has an amount of A. Okay, we can okay, we can do it all at once. Uh, we can do it at constant rate over a period of time until it's gone, or we can do it at a higher constant rate over shorter periods of time. Right. So those are the kind of the three ways to administer a drug. So your a body eliminates a drug at a rate that's proportional to the amount of the drug present. So if you think about drinking coffee or alcohol, for instance, if you only have a little bit of alcohol in your system, uh, your body is not too worried about it and it's going to eliminate it slowly because there's not a lot there, right? It's hard to find it all. It's going to slowly dissipate. However, you have a lot of alcohol, your body will try to flush it out as soon as possible, right? So um, the rate that your body eliminates a drug is proportional to the amount that's present, right? So if we were going to administrate, administer A milligrams of a drug by IV infusion, right? So intravenously over a 24-hour period, right? By infusing half of the amount at a constant rate, over a one hour period every 12 hours. So that means we're going to administer the drug for an hour. So, and then we're gonna, for another hour, 12 hours later, we will um, give the other half of the drug. So over one hour, we will give half the drug. And then 12 hours later, over an hour long period, we will give the last half of the drug, right? So in order to model this, the rate at which we eliminate it, right, is equal to the amount of drugs in our system, which we can model with F1, minus the rate that we are eliminating at, okay? So if Y is the amount of drugs that are in our system, right, then we have drugs being administered and we are eliminating that drug at a rate of K as well, okay? So here YT is the amount of drugs in our body at time T. All right, our function f1 here is a simple, simplified form of a function that we can write in this way, right? So the way that this works is we are administrating half of the drug at some initial point, let's say midnight or 12 p.m., doesn't really matter, at some time, right, for an hour. So it is on a over 2, it's being administered at a time t, right? zero really okay and then we're going to subtract that or turn it off at one right so if you don't remember how these um uh piecewise functions right these unit uh step functions work you can go back to 7.3 i believe is where we discussed this okay um we then at 12 hours later administer half of the drug again and then we stop an hour later right so we stop at 13 so to write this in terms of the Dirac Delta function it would look like this at 0 
right? We administer half the drugs, and this turns off at a certain point, right? It's defined in a way that it turns off for us, right? And so, oops, I went too far there, okay? Right? And then here's the same thing. We'll start at 12 until that half is gone, right? And we're administering an amount of half of A. So the graph below is a graph of F1 of T, that function we just had. And notice that the entire area will give us an area of A, right? So this is half of A plus another half of A. If we're administering A over 2, that's half of A, half of A, that's A. That's the whole thing, right? So for one hour, I administer half of A. And then 12 hours later, for one hour, I administer half of A, right? So by default, right, the length that we call this thing, and actually should probably make more sense for me to call this uh, right here, this uh, sigma over A, right? Because I'm trying to administer uh, A over 2 amount over this period. That's fine. We'll deal with notation later. If the patient wanted the infusions to be shorter, okay, then they may be able to convince the doctor to administer the dosage at twice the rate at half the time, right? So if I want this amount to get administered instead of over an hour, over half an hour, well, I still need the same area. So you can think about it as you're cutting this area in half and adding it on top. So instead of having A over 2 being administered over an hour, I should have A administered over half an hour, right? Same thing here, A for half an hour. So I'm going to have two half hour periods instead, and I can rewrite that equation as F of 2 instead. So it's a little bit different. So the on time is at 0. I turn it off in a half an hour. I administer an amount of A at 12, and then I turn that off. A half an hour later right so 25 over 2 is 12.5 right so that's a fancy way of writing 12.5 right so if I want to write it in a direct Delta function form I can write it like this okay so this is what my graph will look like so they're a little bit skinnier and they're twice as tall right and they're half as wide but they still this is still gonna be half of a and this is still the other half of a Right. So again, notice what's going on here. As my period is decreasing, the height is growing larger. Right. Okay. And we can change this up even more and say instead of doing it over a half an hour, right, we went from an hour to a half hour. Let's say we want to do it over 15 minutes instead. So again, I'd have to cut this in half and double it up. So this should be an amount of 2A, okay? So it should be amount of 2A for 15 minutes, quarter of an hour, so on until I'm off, and then at 12 until 12.25 as well, right? So 49 over 4 is the same as 12.25, okay? And again, I can still write it like this. Notice that it's still uh, delta T and delta T minus 12. It's only the start times that need to be here the value that I'm administering will dictate how long the interval is, right? By the definition of this function, right? I'm letting this get smaller and smaller and smaller. So as this gets, as this value of A gets smaller, it gets larger and larger, right? So really what we're looking at is we're analyzing this delta A function, which is why my notation is off just a little bit. Um, but we're looking at this delta A as A is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we approach this actual direct delta function where we're looking at it instantaneously at a point, right? Okay. So my graph here will look like this, right? Very skinny, very tall, right? So what happens as the infusion time tends towards zero? Well, as the time goes to zero, the dosage amount approaches infinity, right? It gets very, very large, right? So we're basically, instead of giving a little bit over a long time, we're giving a lot over a very short period until we can kind of just shove it all in there all at once, basically, right? 
So for our original inquiry, right, we're basically, we were taking the limit of this as it went to zero, right, as the interval goes to zero. This no longer really applies. This was okay for the first function, right, but as I'm looking at it as I'm approaching that time period to go to zero, this is the proper form to have, okay? So if I want to solve this now, right, this is the problem that I want to solve over two periods, I need to take the Laplace transform of my equation. So I have the Laplace transform of y prime, a over 2 is a constant times the direct delta function, a over 2 times the direct delta function. Apologies, I should have this negative ky here still, right? So I'll make sure I put that in the write-up. So that's missing here, but it should be in this term, okay? As it should be for all of these ones as well, okay? Oh no, not for that, three, sorry. Okay, so this should have the minus ky here still. So I'm going to do the Laplace transform of these. So basically what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to pull out these constants and I'll start to write the uh, the Laplace transform of these um, of this derivative. Okay, so I'm pulling out the constants. Okay, I still have the Laplace transform inside of my function. So for the first derivative, I get s capital y s. Um, this is just e to zero. There's no change here. So again, let's go back here real fast and look at what we have for our Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of the drag delta is just e to the negative s times t naught, whatever that value is that you're looking at there, okay? So for us, here it's t minus zero, so I've got e to the zero, t minus 12, so it's e to the negative 12s, and then here is just uh, ys, right? The first derivative gives me the sys. So here I'm just trying to solve for ys, so I can add this to both sides and pull out that constant ys, um, and that'll give me s plus k, which then I can move back over to divide on this right-hand side. Okay, now this is a terrible, terrible notation, right? I got fractions inside of fractions, all kinds of crazy stuff, so let's start to simplify this out. I can pull out the uh, a over 2, and that leaves me with 1 over s plus k and e to the negative 12s over the s plus k. And then from here, I have a common denominator, so I can combine these together. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I don't need to combine them together, but I should pull this down so that I have 1 over s minus my minus k. So it looks like what I need for me to start to do my inverse Laplace transform. All right, so remember what we have for these, uh, an inverse Laplace transform times a function. Okay, so my function will look like this, right? So this is what e to the negative k looks like. This is also e to the negative k. And this is just the heavy side function shift by 12, okay? So then that is my solution, okay? Now, if I was given the rate of absorption, k, then I could, and if I was given an amount of the drug to be administered, I could find this a little bit more exactly, right? And I could graph it and all that kind of fun stuff, right? But the Laplace transform is pretty easy for the direct delta function, and the direct delta function is a very, very common function you're going to run into, especially, again, my engineers and physicists. Thank you.